All right, I want to talk to you today about the coming housing market crash. <laughs> There's a whole lot of things I could say about this one, and I'm going to be saying a lot of different things, and we're going to go to a couple places in Scripture. But um, as a child of God, uh, you're supposed to lay up for your children. You're supposed to, a man that's married is supposed to provide for his own, especially for they have his own house. And if I don't, then I'm an infidel and I've denied the faith. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 talks about that. Uh, there's financial stuff that has to come in. And unfortunately, within the last 100 years or so, we've had a lot of scams that have come out in America and around the world as well. Um, we've gone off the gold and silver standard and things not quite 100 years ago. If you want to go back then, we still had gold and silver coins. You know, in 1922, uh, the gold was confiscated after that. But the point is, the Federal Reserve was created. It's not federal. It's not reserve. It's, it's a private run-for-profit corporation. It's not a real bank, in other words, um, in terms of one that would be controlled by the government or something like that that should be printing the government's money at the, you know, for the good of the American people. It's not that at all. Uh, most countries have central banks. They have uh, manipulated currencies and everything else. That's what all this wealth creation has been, all the system of debt. And so if you go back 100, we'll say 120 years ago, uh, most people could have afforded to either build a house or buy a house or whatever else. You would have worked hard. You know, there would have been no, this big system of debt and everything else. Um, actually looked it up, the uh, National Association of Realtors or whatever, um, they actually had on their website, you can go to their, to their website and check this out for yourself. And they said that realtors, you know, and, and sort of uh, real estate, you know, brokers, in other words, the guys that go show you houses and whatever else, um, they, uh, the, they, they first came to America, I guess, in 1908 is when the whole thing was first formed. Now, there might have been some around before then, but that National Association of Realtors was officially not formed until 1908 is when the first realtors came. So what did they do before then? It's just, it's amazing, you know, so many, so much corruption that we live under right now didn't even exist 100 years ago, or uh, we'll say 150 years ago, to be more accurate. Um, and the scams and the, the scheming, and over the last 100 years, more millionaires have been made through real estate than any other way. And there's so many things out there. I saw a thing years ago where some guy was a billionaire because he was buying trailer parks all over the country and a lot of them were for con convicted uh, sex offenders that they could stay at these trailer parks but then he would charge them charge them really high rates and uh, he made a lot of money and of course slum lords you hear the infamous slum lord thing some guy buys up a couple city blocks of apartment buildings and he doesn't take care of them and there's been a lot of scheming in real estate with how people live and where people live. Uh, it's, and I could go off on a whole big thing about that, but I just want to go over some of the big points of this whole thing. Because here's the thing with the economy. I can quote reports to show you that the economy is getting worse. But then there are people out there that can quote reports that show the opposite. You go with mainstream media, they're saying, oh, the housing market's never been better. It's booming. Uh, although some are starting to finally admit, no, it's actually a bubble that's going to pop soon. Um, well, we have our statistics. Well, we have our statistics. We have this, we have that. And so who determines what the truth is? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If there's biblical principles that are being violated within the housing market system, then you go with the biblical principles. See how that works. So I'm going to show you three different principles today in the scriptures that show why the modern housing market thing is a complete scam it's terrible. Um, it puts a lot of younger people just completely out of the market for buying, you know, there's just no way I can ever afford a home. Um, I mean, even myself, I'm not a millennial anywhere close to that. <laughs> I was born in 1975, so I'm pretty, you know, an older guy here. I'm heading towards 50 years old, another couple of years. But even in my native state of Pennsylvania, there was just no way that I could ever afford a home. And I knew guys my age that bought homes and they were small little places in a development, you know, dead end street or something like that. And, you know, they, they're going to be paying till they're, you know, 80 years old or something. I mean, it's crazy. Well, maybe not 80 years old, but they'll be paying for a long time. They'll be in their fifties. 
uh, maybe 60s by the time their house is paid for. Some tiny little ranch house or whatever else with no land. So why did this whole thing happen? How did this whole thing come about? And is there going to be, become or will there be a housing market crash in the future? Um, yes, absolutely. And point number one, which nobody can deny, uh, whatever side you're on, well, I think it's getting better. I think it's stronger. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, what do they say? Uh, bullish, I guess. You know, it's a bull market right now. Bull, the horns are up. And the bear, you know, his claws come down. So just remember, good markets are going up. That's a bull market. Bear markets are when they come down. It was explained to me that way. You know, um, the bull up, bear down. Say that. So some people would say, you know, I see it as a bullish market. It's getting better. I see it as a bear market. It's getting worse. Um, but let's look at fact number one here, why it will burst. Why we are not actually seeing this whole thing of, of uh, oh, the market's just getting better. Look at, even during a pandemic, the market got better and better. Why did it get better and better though? And there's a whole lot of things I could get into, but there's a very big factor which never happened before. I don't believe at all in the history of the United States, certainly maybe the history of the world, I don't know. But certainly the history of the United States, this never happened before. And it happened during the you know, 2020 to 2021. And that is they stopped doing foreclosures and evictions. Locked people into their homes. And then the people said, I can't go to work. And they said, oh, it's okay. We'll send you money. More on that later. And we won't foreclose your home. You don't have to make payments. You don't have to pay what you owe. And we'll just kind of look the other way. We'll put your house into forbearance or, you know, this moratorium stuff or whatever else. And you can stay there rent free, mortgage free for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, what does the Bible say about that? Psalm 37. And by the way, you say, well, how does that affect house prices? Well, if there's foreclosed homes coming on the market, that's going to lower the price of housing. But if you go for two years and there's no foreclosed homes and there aren't any evictions, Kind of makes the uh, competition there a little bit difficult. Psalm 37. And it violates scripture. That whole thing violates scripture. Just think of people not having to pay. Psalm 37 verse 21. The wicked borroweth, huh, the debt system, and payeth not again. But the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Isn't that what happened last two years? You say, well, well, yeah, but brother, there was a serious health thing there. And we, people just could it wasn't a serious health thing. I mean, look at the statistics. 99.9% .9 recovery rate. That's not a serious health issue. You know, you don't ever lock the economy down. And, you know, and that's what I said that this whole thing was about the last two years. It wasn't some kind of a public health crisis or whatever else. It was about destroying the economy. 2019, it was looking really bad for the economy. And then what did they do? They made it even worse. And it was, by the way, it was Donald Trump that was in at the time. Remember that? Remember the whole thing of how it got started? So don't give me this stuff of, oh, Joe Biden, or Joe Biden's really messed up the country. Don't fall for the left-right paradigm, okay? That stuff is nonsense. The people at the top are all subservient to the Vatican. They're all subservient to that whole setup of the Jesuits and everything else. Uh, I mean, both men have connections to the Jesuits, okay? I think Joe Biden has gotten honorary Jesuit degrees. Donald Trump went to Fordham University. So, and he sent all of his children to Jesuit schools, as I think Biden did as well. So don't give me this thing of, oh, you don't have any proof or whatever. I have all the proof you need. But the whole point is this whole, during this whole health crisis thing, all these people, I'm not paying my debts. I'm not going to pay for my vehicle, whatever. And then when they get the stimulus check type of deal, that what do they do? A lot of people went out, they, they're buying big screen TVs. They're buying brand new vehicles. Oh, my house payments? Ah, no, I don't need to do that. Some people did. Some people put it towards that. But a lot of people just went out and blew it. They just wasted it. People just gambling on the stock market and doing all kinds of stuff, home equity, lines of credit and whatever, trying to, I mean, just insane. The greed and the corruption that this whole thing, you know, did. And I mean, you have the Federal Reserve, they can just print money as much as they want. So, oh, hey, you know, we're having a hard time financially here. Let's print 
quantitative easing. Let's have quantitative easing one, then two, then three, then four, and then I think it was infinity or something after that. Crazy. Absolutely, absolutely nuts. And a lot of that stuff was done under Trump. And Biden just continued it. I mean, you look at the, the debt that our country has accrued over the last 10, 12 years. It's insane. More than any nation in history. Um, although I think China might have surpassed us a little bit there. But you say, but, okay, brother, yeah, all right, the inflation thing, or excuse me, the uh, foreclosure and eviction thing, okay, I could see how that would drive housing prices up because the foreclosed homes aren't there to keep the prices low. Okay, I can see that, you know, yeah, all right. People are staying in their homes, they're not making payments, and the whole deal. Um, yeah, I can see that. But what about inflation? See, we have a lot of inflation right now. The government's saying 8 point something percent. That's nonsense. You look at some of the different... The, how, how much, you know, food prices have gone up, it's way over 8%. You know, it fluctuates between different types of food and gas prices and, you know, home heating oil and whatever else. There's, they're just going way up. And most of them are up, you know, going up over 8 point whatever percent. So they're just trying to say, say I guess on average, it's 8 point whatever percent, which is nonsense. But let's just say this whole thing of, Housing prices went up, Brother Brian, because inflation is going up. I've heard that one. I had different people say that to me. It's, it's inflation. That's what's causing the house prices to go up. No, that's not true. Okay? Um, inflation does not make house prices go up because it makes people have less money. So people can't afford mortgages. Inflation actually does the opposite. The only way to make house prices truly go up, if you study the real economics of it, not mainstream media, you study the true economics of it, the only way to make house prices go up is to increase earnings. People make more money, they can afford a bigger mortgage. But if inflation is going up and you're paying more at the grocery store and more for gas and more for everything else, you're not going to afford your house payments anymore. So don't fall for that one. That's another mainstream media lie. They'll say, well, and it's inflation, that's driving the house prices up. And we're just going to keep seeing the house prices go up and up and up. And unfortunately, there's some really, really corrupt realtors out there. There's some good ones, but there's some really corrupt ones out there. And what they're doing is they're saying they'll show you the over the last two years, this house increased in value by this much. They won't tell you why it increased in value, but they'll it's increased in value. So fear of missing out, you better buy one now. Buy now. Now's the time to buy. Because if you don't buy now, that house, it was worth 200000 back there. And then it went up to 300000 Now it's 450000 it's going to be $600,000 in another year because of inflation. <laughs> no, they're lying to you. It's not going to keep going up. The markets were, you know, there was a whole bunch of things. I mean, hedge funds and whatever else came in. They were buying up a lot of this real estate and, and whatever. There was so much scheming. There was so much free money that was being given out and whatever else. The Federal Reserve just printing money and giving it to people and whatever, they're going out and buying all kinds of real estates. The Federal Reserve themselves owns $9 trillion in physical assets in this country. $9 trillion they own? A lot of the mortgages, I forget what the percentage of mortgages here in America that the Federal Reserve owns? I thought you're just supposed to be there to print money for the American people. What are you doing buying up the American people's homes? And check it out. Check me out on, on all that stuff. Again, you know, I could... I, the news is happening so quickly right now. I was going to do a really detailed study here, show a lot of the proof and put documentation. It's just happening so quickly. I thought, I just need to get the basics out there, get people to rely on the word of God and look and say, okay, if there are wicked borrowing and not paying again, that's a bad thing. That's sin. It's national sin. But um, give you a couple more things on inflation. Uh, our inflation. Is inflation driving home prices up? Income in the last year, income in the last year went up 6%. Okay, household income, 6%. Mortgage, in, or excuse me, uh, house prices, not mortgage interest rates. That's the next one. <laughs> house prices went up 49% in the same time frame. So earnings went up 6%. House prices went up 49%. Huh. They say, well, yeah, but uh, the, the mortgage rates, the interest rates at 5.5 something percent, I think, right now or whatever else, if you're really doing good, if you can get a prime you know, mortgage. Um, 
5.5 something percent for a 30 year, you know, fixed rate mortgage or whatever. So it's, you know, that's not, I mean, it's high. It's gone up quite a bit, you know, two or three points or something in the last, I think, since the beginning of the year or whatever. Um, but it's not anywhere close to the 1970s and 80s. Back then it was 10 to 20 percent, whatever else you hear all these wild numbers and everything else. See, so 5.5 whatever percent, uh, it's not that bad here. In, this is May of 2022, by the way. I should state that because it's going to go a lot higher. Um, so it's not that bad, Brother Brian. It's been far worse in the past. Yes, but you're not, you are ignoring the, you know, debt to income ratio, okay? What were the price of houses back in the 1970s and 80s? They were a lot cheaper. What were people making? Well, you say not as much as today. Yeah, sure, but if you look at the percentage, it was a lot, those people could afford those homes. So the interest rate, not a huge big deal. Now, you have interest rates causing people's mortgage rates to go up, you know, five, seven hundred dollars many times from one month, month to the next if they have a adjustable rate mortgage it's going up hundreds of dollars and people are going to start saying hey I can't afford this you know I'm it's costing me a hundred plus dollars at the gas station now to put gas in my you know truck or whatever at the grocery store I go in there and there's packages of meat in the grocery store for sixty dollars yeah, I'm hearing stories of, of uh, restaurants and they're, you know, you go in there and, and it's $55 for a person, you know, $110 if you get some of the seafood things and whatever. That's crazy. So do not believe the thing of, uh, you know, well, see, there's the interest rate thing's not a big deal and it's just inflation and it's, you know, that's driving the house prices up. That's all part of the lies that they're telling people. Proverbs chapter 22. You say, what's this thing about debt? What's behind this whole thing? And again, I'm just, I'm giving you three different passages of Scripture, three different verses to get the concepts of Scripture, of truth, the Word of God, into your mind so that you can easily spot a scam. You say, if it lines up with this, if there are wicked people borrowing and they're not paying their debts off, that's sin. That's national sin. I'll show you another one here. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. What's going on? What happened in the last 100 years? Well, the rich men started to come out and they started the scheme and they, you know, the whole Jekyll Island thing with the Federal Reserve and whatever else. Again, look into that if you want to. They schemed behind closed doors. They conspired. You know, J.P. Morgan, you know, and some of these other big guys back in the early 1900s, John D. Rockefeller Sr., a lot of these, you know, big oil men, big bankers and whatever, they got together and they started to say, how can we enslave the American people? And that's what they did. They worked hard to do that. And under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they took away the gold. And then under Lyndon Baines Johnson, they took away the silver. And then under Ronald Reagan, they took away the copper in our coins. They've been scheming to enslave the American people and the people all around the world too, by the way. I have a lot of viewers of other countries and things. All the different governments have all been doing this by design. They all closed down their economies for two years, essentially. You know, you might as well just say for two years because even when they were reopened, it was, oh, you can't come in here unless you have a pass or you can't do this and you can't do that. It's not good for the economy. So they've been scheming, and ultimately it's going to bring in the mark of the beast. That's what the whole thing is for. That's what it's all about. But uh, our passage there in Proverbs 22, verse 7, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Um, when you get saved, the Bible says that you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ. We're bought with a price. Our life is not our own. Satan has to counterfeit that. And the way that he's going to counterfeit it is with the mark of the beast system. And he's going to say, hey, your life's not your own. You do what I tell you to do. And brethren, we have to fight the whole central bank digital currency thing, and especially the social credit score that's hooked up to it. We have to speak against it. We have to fight it, try to use cash. I, again, I did a video on it. Please watch that video. Um, it's a bad situation. Because what they could do, somebody like me, I preach the word of God, they could shut me down. 
and just simply say, until you comply with, you know, the gospel of Joel Osteen or, you know, whatever, I guess Rick Warren's gone now, but, you know, these, you know, the, the nice love thing and it happy and don't ever speak about conspiracy stuff or whatever, um, we're just going to have to shut down your card, Mr. Denlinger. We're, so, we're very sorry for the inconvenience. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> they never are. They can shut me down. And uh, right now, we're completely debt-free. And I understand that there are people out there um, that have mortgages. I get it. Again, the whole housing market thing has been a scam now for a long time, and they force it that if you want to have a regular house, um, either you need to move to the middle of nowhere like what we did, uh, or you're going to be in mortgage debt. Okay, I understand that. I'm not going to look my nose down at you because you have a mortgage. Whatever, I get it. Uh, you, you know, try to pay it off, try to get out of that debt system, but you know, what happens a lot of times is people say, well, I have a mortgage, so I have to have a good job. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah, that's right. But I have to have a good vehicle to get to my good job so I can get my mortgage or get my money to pay off my mortgage. Then you get into debt with a vehicle. And then, well, you know, there's the stress of my job, so I need to get a boat or a UTV or this or that. We'll get a little bit more debt, and then you get a little bit more debt, and pretty soon you're drowning in debt. And you're paying for groceries with a credit card or something. Paying your electric bill with a credit card. <laughs> you know, or if you get really bad, then you're paying credit card debts with other credit cards. I've known people that have done that. Um, absolutely insane. So, but Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The borrower is servant to the lender. You say, well, I don't think America has any problems with uh, borrowing. Let me give you just three simple statistics here, and you can look this up on your own. National debt is now over $30 trillion. Just go to, I think it's nation, or debtclock.org, and you can see it just ramping up all the time. It's crazy. Student loan debt is now over $1.7 trillion. Uh, okay, I did a video years ago, and it was much less than that, you know, on the point of the whole thing of should you go to college or whatever else. Uh, oh, we're going to prepare you for life. We're going to get you ready so that you can have a good career. Uh, what do you do with $1.7 trillion of student loan debt? And they're trying to get it forgiven right now. Get Biden to forgive it. No, no. And again, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. You go to some college someplace and then you say, oh, it should be forgiven. Uh, I'm not going to pay for your college debt. That's not right. But I just found that interesting. And I shouldn't be paying for somebody's student loan debt either. That's ridiculous. And you're only destroying the country by doing that. Number three, credit card debt is $856 billion. $856 billion is what Americans have in terms of credit card debt, personal credit card debt. That's not good. Uh, we're dealing with a, a nation of slaves right now. So we got rid of slavery back in you know, the Civil War, Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, no, actually we didn't. In the early 1900s, they created a new form of slavery called debt. Okay, and I realized that there was debt before, and I, I get that. But not on the level that we've seen in the last 100 years. 120 years, we'll say it that way. It's absolutely insane what's happened. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. To the New Testament. We'll go to the last passage of Scripture here. Again, I'm just trying to get you the concepts here. Um, I'm not going to go into some huge, big, mega study on all that the Bible has to say about debt and the whole history of banking and whatever else, because it, then things get lost. You know, all there's so much detail, and you start to lose the basic concepts of Scripture. Don't borrow money if you're not going to pay. Okay. Um, if you borrow money, you will be a servant to the lender. I don't care if it's for a week. Hey, I need to go get some payday loan or something like this or, or a buy now, pay later, later thing or something like that. Um, I'm going to pay it off. I'll have the money to pay it off. You're gambling. You are a servant to the lender. If you walk away and you say, oh, I, I can't pay it this week, you're going to pay more in the future. You get into some of these credit cards, um, the interest rates on them, on those things are just crazy. And you get behind a few months in your payments, you're finished. And again, I've known people, good jobs and everything else. I knew of one couple uh, back 
down where I grew up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, there was a couple. They both were postal workers, both making you know pretty decent money. And I think they had something like eighty thousand dollars in credit card debt. You know, and you just end up paying on the principal, or the uh, the interest rather, not the principal. Second Thessalonians chapter three verse ten, another great uh, verse here that kicks what we went through the last two years. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Huh. If any would not work, neither should he eat. Well, you need to work for your money. I'll give you three statistics here. The U.S. spends $746 billion a year on welfare. $746 billion a year for people that don't want to work. That's a problem. Between March of 2020 and July of 2021, there was $794, $794 billion excuse me, spent on unemployment. <laughs> and, you know, well, brother, there, there's exceptions. In it. Yeah, but you know how many people abuse that system? Both unemployment and welfare? How many people... I mean, I've heard the stories of people, I'm making more on unemployment and getting government you know, aid and whatever else than I would be if I was out working. I can sit around at home watching TV and enjoying being with my family and whatever else. This is great. No, the Bible teaches if you don't work, you're not supposed to eat. Period. You say, well, uh, both men and women? Well, if you're a young man, you need to work. You need to have a job. I'll be saying more about that here in a little bit. Young woman, work around the house. If you have parents that are okay with you being there and being a keeper at home and things, work hard around the house. Hey, Mom, I'm going to go in and clean the toilet. I'll do the dishes, Mom. Don't worry about that. Let me do the laundry. Let me mop the floor over here and whatever else. Work. You're supposed to work. You're supposed to do things with your life. You know, a lot of people do, oh, Denlinger doesn't work. Oh, he's unemployed. And Watch my videos I did. What does Brian Denlinger do for a living? Parts one and two. Uh, yes, I've worked quite a bit over the years. And some very lowly jobs, too, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. But uh, in the uh, scamdemic thing, the stimulus money, um, $5 trillion was the, the one stimulus thing that they did. $5 trillion. I think $1.8 went to the people or something like that. People getting stimulus checks for staying at home. Well, brother, we had no choice, you know, because uh, there was a deadly disease and things. No, there wasn't. Um, brother, we had no choice. They, they locked us down in our homes. You should have disobeyed. I did. Uh, I'm not going to let anybody lock me in my home. Something like that. Oh, hey, there's a deadly thing out there. Okay, then it's up to me what to do about that. Um, I believe in natural health. I can heal people naturally. Okay. Um, then let me go out and take my chances out there. You know, I mean, neighbor. I said this in one of my videos. Had a neighbor, my next door neighbor, at our property. He said, I saw a mountain lion the other night. Please be careful with your son. Now, do you think, which one should I be more afraid of? A virus that hasn't been isolated and purified in a laboratory setting, or a mountain lion that could kill my little boy or even me if I'm not really careful or something like that? I mean, they're not usually aggressive, but you know what I'm saying here. Uh, I live in an area where I could, you know, be attacked or killed by a wild animal. But I'm supposed to be worried about something that hasn't even been proven to exist. Absolute nuttiness. Um, well, people got sick. Well, people get sick before, okay? <laughs> and there's a lot of different things that can make you sick. But, uh, hey, I, well, I couldn't go out and I couldn't work and whatever else, so I needed to have that stimulus money. Did you work for it? Did you work for it? No. Then you violated scripture. Plain and simple. Um, I know of a situation here locally. There was a place that was going into pre-foreclosure. Pre Very nice place and a good price and everything else. And I thought, man, that's pretty neat. You know, didn't have the money for it at the time or whatever. And But I looked at it and I thought, wow, that'd be a neat place to have an old, you know, farm and everything, barn and all that stuff. Really neat thing there. And and that was pre-foreclosure, like I said, which is you don't make bank payments for three months. That was in uh, late 2019, 
I think early 2020. And then they, the whole thing happened and, and the stimulus checks are coming out. And next thing you know, it's off the market. They took the stimulus money and they paid it. You say, well, that's good. That's a good idea and whatever. Uh, no, because they didn't work for it. All right. You say, well, what about you, Brian? You took the stimulus check just like the rest of us. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I never took any. I never took one cent of stimulus money. And I'll tell you what else. Uh, a couple years ago, I had jury duty. I went in there. It was unconstitutional. It was, it was wicked. They never even informed the jurors of their right to, to uh, jury nullification, to hang the jury if, if they saw that there was corruption in the trial. Never said a word about that. I've done videos on that. Again, you can go back and watch those old videos that I did on the jury thing. And you know what I did? They sent me the check from the couple days that I went to jury duty. I burned it. I didn't cash it. I didn't feel right about that. I'm not working. Uh, I want to get paid for the work that I do. And ironically, you know, being in ministry and putting out material for free, a lot of times I don't get paid for the work that I do. Uh, so, but I still work. I still work hard. Uh, I have plenty of scars on my body and plenty of aching bones and joints and muscles and whatever else to prove that I've worked hard all my life. You know, uh, I work very hard in the ministry. Um, I wouldn't feel right taking money from people if I didn't. Plain and simple. And quite frankly, uh, I wouldn't still be here because God would have stopped me a long time ago. Well, God doesn't stop false prophets. Or whatever. You, know, you can, people, there are people out there that will argue points and get all philosophical and what about this? And da -da 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 -da. <laughs> I don't have time for that. But here's the whole point. And I'm probably going to end up doing a video on this in the future. Uh, I'm seeing a disturbing trend, um, and some of it, unfortunately, is some of my viewers out there. Um, a lot of young men living at home with their parents, and you can't find work and whatever else you say and, and whatever. Um, you need to work really hard on that. Um, I've been written, you know, I've had guys write me letters and things, what should I do, and whatever else. Young guys that are in college, and they're saying, should I continue in college? Should I move back home? Should I do this? Should I do that? The biggest problem, and I understand what you're going through, the biggest problem for you is morale. Just to be real blunt with you here, I'm going to speak to you the way that you need to be spoken to. You have very low morale. You have very low, very little reason to go out and do anything with your life because a lot of you, you understand we're in the end times and you just think, well, what's the point? Um, whatever. And I went through that phase myself. So I know what you're going through. Um, and I just kind of thought to myself years ago, well, you know, 2010, 2011, I was in this mindset of, you know, I might as well just play video games and listen to sermons and preaching and I'm learning about the word of God and whatever. And I'm growing spiritually, but I'll never get married. I'll never, you know, have my own home or anything else and certainly never have children. Well, uh, here I am. Uh, I do have a wife now. I do have a son. Um, and, you know, a lot of things the Lord's blessed me with. That's because I work hard for it, in spite of what my enemies like to say. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that whole thing I did with that stupid Alexa thing where I chopped it in half. Um, you know, Brian Denlinger is a whatever crazy preacher, you know, unemployed. How am I unemployed? Yeah, I pay taxes, you know, on the stuff, on things that I sell and, and whatever. How am I unemployed? <laughs> you know, um, I have different streams of income. And again, I have to say this to you young men out there, you should be out working. You really should be. I did for years. Okay. My very first job was at the Strasburg Railroad. You know what it was? I was bussing tables, they call it. You don't know what that means. It just simply means I was going out, I'd watch. It was basically like a little fast food, you know, restaurant, like a McDonald's or something. And I'd watch and okay, the people got up and they walked away and their tables dirty from all the crumbs and things that they spilled. And they spilled their milkshake or whatever else there. And I'd take a thing of hot soapy water and I'd walk out and I'd clean up the trash and, and I'd wipe, wipe the tables down, wipe the seat down. If it, oh, they dropped a bunch of food on, in underneath, I'd take the broom, I'd sweep it up, get it in the dustpan, go throw it out. That was my job to go over to the trash area 
and they had the little brown little cafeteria type of trays where they'd put the people's food on. They'd take it over to where they're sitting. And I'd take the big stack of trays and I'd go back in and I'd wash all the trays and get them and I'd stack them back underneath at the cash registers and things. And, and just, that's what I did. I was cleaning up people's, the, the food that fell out of their mouth, you know, the waste there. That's what I did. And being at the Strasburg Railroad in Pennsylvania, the, the steam engines would go by and the, the coal smoke would come out. Every day, you'd wipe stuff down and be black, you know, from that coal smoke, just in the air all the time. Um, that's what I did. You say you did that for just a, you know, a week or two because it was too hard. Uh, no, I did that for uh, a couple of years, actually. And I worked hard. And so I went from bussing tables to all of a sudden they said, we want to put you on the cash register. You take the orders. You don't have to go out there and clean that stuff anymore because we see you're a hard worker. So I did that for a year. I think it was my first year I went, I was bussing tables. Next year I was cash register. Year after that, they said, Hey, how would you like to cook? Really? Yeah. I get to work at the big, huge griddle thing back there, flipping burgers. Yeah. Okay. You know, you can make waffles for the waffle cone, cone iron. You can do the chicken over here and, and things. And I remember the one time it was rainy and there weren't that many people coming. It was a low day for tourism and, and things. And all the employees, all the teenagers are out front at the cash registers, you know, talking and things. And I looked in underneath where the warming rack was. That restaurant's not even there now. That's they've the dining car restaurant. They totally changed it. We were down in Pennsylvania in 2018. It was totally different. So I can't really prove anything. You say, I'll go there and you can see what I'm talking about. It's been totally, you know, new owners totally been changed. But they used to have the big warming rack where they would have the hamburgers and the chicken sandwiches and whatever else, you know, lined up. And underneath it, there was a place on, on the underneath the counter there where they had all the hot dog buns and the hamburger buns, the bags of them stored in underneath there. And it was just filthy, you know, they just never any time to clean it. So I went and I got one of the little rolling cart things and I put it there and I took all the hot dog buns out and all the bags of the hot dog buns and hot hamburger buns and everything put them up there, went and got some hot soapy water, and I'm down on my knees, you know, washing it all out and underneath there. And the owner of the restaurant, Joyce uh, Homan, I think was her name. Schmidt was the original name, but then she re got remarried. She came over, she watched, and she said, thank you for doing that, Brian. I really appreciate that. And I said, oh, yeah, no problem. I just saw it needed to be done. You know, just nothing to do. I just wanted to get something done. I'm working, you know. And she said, thank you. Next year, which would have been my fourth year, um, her son, Keith, uh, he said, hey, he said, come on back here. I want to talk to you. Okay. And went back and he said, hey, we're going to be doing a dinner train um, where we're going to be serving food on the train. And uh, how would you like to be on that? You can ride the train back and forth and serve and cook food and everything else and and then we'll have waiters and waitresses and they'll be taking the food into the people. Would you like to be on the train? Yeah, that'd be great. And so for the last two years, year four, year five, um, which would have ended in 1994, um, so it'd have been 1989, I think, to 1994, I worked on the train. And I was a cook there. And by the way, um, that was seasonal. That job was seasonal. So during the time I was at the Strasburg Railroad, uh, I also was working as a cabinet maker um, at a Mennonite uh, cabinet shop up in Hinkletown, cabinet maker slash furniture maker. So I worked in a wood shop, um, making different things there and staining them and, you know, doing finishing and whatever else. I also worked at another restaurant, Timberline Lodge, which also went out of business many years ago, and I was a dishwasher. And... Um, so I've done some pretty lowly jobs. I've never worked at a grocery store bagging groceries or never worked some other lower jobs like that, you know, the teenagers typically get. But uh, it taught me some things. It taught me how to be humble and how to work hard and how that you can advance if you work hard. If you show the boss that uh, I'm not like these other teenagers that's just standing around on, on company time and talk with each other. I'm here to work. I'm here because you're paying me money. And, you know, instead of staying home, a lot of you young guys out there, young girls, you, you're supposed to be keepers at home. 
I get that. You, you know, you should stay at home and help your family out and everything else. You shouldn't be going out into the workforce. You know, unless your family owns a business or something like that, then, you know, okay, I get it. But you're going out and getting a job and, oh, I want to have a successful career. Or, oh, I'm just doing it till I get a boyfriend or a husband or something. You can make arguments for it. I get it. But young guys, you really don't have an excuse. Um, and here's another challenge, which I don't know if I said this earlier, but this is something that's very important. How did people make it through the Great Depression? How did men make it through the Great Depression? They made it through with multiple skill sets. I mean, I read the history book of this area here, Patton, Mount Chase area, and uh, I don't know if I have it in here or not, but I think it's out on the other bookshelf out in the hallway, but um, it's fascinating. I mean, there are guys in this area, they were undertakers. They also did blacksmithing, auto mechanic type of stuff, and they logged in the winter. <laughs> You know, you had other guys, they're farming in the summer, logging in the winter. They also were a hunting and fishing guide. And they had guys doing four or five different careers, so to speak, careers, different jobs. And that's how they made it through the Great Depression. You young guys out there, I'm, I'm telling you, it's very important. You know, oh, Brother Brian, he's doing YouTube and things. Yeah, after many years of working, after a long time of working. Um, and a lot of my skills and things came because of learning you know, how to work. And I think it's very important for young men to, to make it a goal in your life. Um, get out there and work. Get Do multiple different jobs. Learn how to do different things. Um, learn how to sell things uh, on eBay, on Etsy, or whatever else. Make things with your hands. Do something. Don't just sit there in front of the computer and watch me and, you know, check this and check that and whatever else. Um, You know, I made the decision years ago that I was going to do this ministry, not for the money. Uh, I mean, I, I left the art world. You know, I was making four or $500 on a, on a wooden bowl that I would make and things. I mean, I've showed some of that stuff in, the, in past videos. I left that to do this. And, you know, oh, you make so much money and whatever. Well, not really. You know, not for the amount of work and the hours that I put in. Um, why did I do this? I did this because of charity. I did this thing to get the truth out. And a lot of you guys out there, you're learning a lot from me, and I appreciate that, and it's great. But then you're just sitting at home. I'm telling you, that's not good. It's really not good. And I don't see good times coming for you, quite frankly. And you say, what about you, Brian? Uh, well, I'm going to be starting to do some more secular stuff as time goes by. I have multiple skill sets. Um... You know, looking out at the future, I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, home heating oil right now in the Northeast where I'm at is $7 a gallon for home heating oil. Whoa, that's a lot of money. I heard people complaining when it was $4 a gallon. Okay, right now it's kind of the off season, so people aren't really thinking about it. But the way things are going, um, it could be rationed or, you know, 10 or more dollars a gallon or something like that and these people with their big homes which is also going to drive down house prices by the way i might add um, people not being able to afford their homes anymore even just to even heat them is going to be a huge expense in the future but looking at this whole thing i'm thinking you know i could make some money doing firewood this year i used to do that i used to sell firewood uh, i sold quite a few cords of firewood uh, down through the years um I might go back into that. I might go into, you know, there's a bunch of things that I can do. And how did I learn that stuff? Uh, well, I was taught a lot of it, but some of it I taught myself. I got books, I read, I studied and, and things. Um, I've done a lot of different things for a living over the years. I used to do tree work for people, cutting trees down. They have a tree that's leaning towards the house or something, I'd go take it down for them. You know, I get paid to do that. Um, you know, buying and selling vehicles and things like that. Can you do any mechanical type of stuff on your vehicle? Can you get an older car and fix it up and make some money on it? Just trying to challenge you here, uh, young men out there. Um, you can make a pretty good living. And don't say, well, the Lord's coming back. The Lord could be coming back in 10 years. Okay? It might be longer. I don't know. Oh, no, I think it's going to be any day now. Uh, be careful. Uh, there's no temple in Jerusalem for the Antichrist to sit in. 
and I don't think they're building it in three and a half years. Okay, so um, the mark of the beast technology is not quite here yet. There could be quite a few years out there. All right, um, this year, 2022, is my wife and I here on the 20th of this month. It'll be our 10th year anniversary. 10 years of marriage. Back when I thought, you know, oh man, you know, there's just no way. 2011, this is the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. This has to be the year of the rapture. Uh, no, it wasn't. You know, well, Fukushima and all this other stuff. And, oh, look at the, you know, the changes, climate change, not climate changes, but the, all the stuff that God's, you know, judgment and hitting and things. It has to be soon. Look, Keep looking up, brethren. It's going to be soon. Uh, yeah, here we are 10 years later. And we could be here another 10, 11, 12 years, something like that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but be encouraged, brethren. Okay? The debt system is going to break down. Okay? All good things come to an end. And this is where I'm going to end this study here. Not a real detailed study. Uh, the debt system is going to break down. Because the currency, they're either going to have to hyperinflate it by continuing to print it, or they're going to keep driving this up and that up and this and scheming this and scheming that and whatever else. And there's people that are saying, well, maybe if they come out with a digital currency, they can just kind of wipe out the debts, you know, and, and whatever. And there'd be geopolitical stuff there. Well, we'll bring in World War III to redo this and redo that and all this. There's going to be scheming. There's no doubt about that. But the point is, you can get out there, you can make money, you can have your own place, you can do things, something out there. Again, our land that we have and this house that we have, it wasn't 100% donations. Okay, please understand that. It was also vehicles that I was buying and selling on the side, fixing up, doing work on things. There's other things that we've done and made money besides the ministry. And I'm going to be doing a lot more of that as time goes by, especially because I have a little boy now who's getting up into that time frame here where he can start to help me. And I need to start passing on the skills that God has shown me and taught me. I need to pass those on to my son so that when he grows up, he's not going to be sitting around, you know, basically useless, sitting on a computer, not knowing how to do anything. And, you know, again, to encourage you, uh, I'm not a multi-generational woodworker. My dad was an engineer at a big, you know, farm machinery place, Ford New Holland. He never taught me how to work with wood. I taught myself. It wasn't some kind of a thing of, oh, you know, you just had all your skills passed on to you. No, I didn't. I taught myself. I had lots of scars on my hands to prove that. <laughs> uh, my dad never taught me how to log. I bought books and I went out and I tried it. I read and I studied and I went out and I did it. My dad never even really taught me how to do much with auto mechanic type of stuff. And I have a lot more to learn there. I'm not an expert auto mechanic by any means. But brethren, you, you need to do something with your life. You really need to. And, you know, it's not just, I'm not singling out anybody out there. I'm not saying, you know, well, brother, you know, you, you know, you've written to me. And so I'm talking just to you. I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to a lot of young men. All right, I've been contacted by hundreds of young men, and it's all, what should I do, brother? What should, you know, the, I'm living with my parents, and I can't get a job, or I can't hold a job, or whatever. You need to get motivated, all right? And what I'm saying is, part of the way for me to motivate you is, as the debt system comes down, if you have cash, you're going to be able to buy things. Again, please understand one of the basic concepts of how to get rich in this current system. And that is you buy when things are low and you sell when things are high. Okay? That's very important. You have to understand that. You have to know how to invest your money at the right time. It isn't just working really hard and putting your money in the bank. You have to know when to buy and when to sell. How can you do that if you're just sitting at home watching me? You can't. So please get motivated. And don't think that any job out there is below you. Because that's not true. Um, I was 14 years old when I first started, when I got my first job at the Strasburg Railroad, 14 years old, and I was motivated. You know why? Because I wanted my own car. And I actually bought my first car at 15 years old. It was a Volkswagen Beetle, by the way, an old Volkswagen Beetle. I paid $75 for it. <laughs> Drove it around the woods, you know, at my parents' place on our land there. We had some logging trails back in through and things. 
drove it around. We had six and a half acres of land. Cruising around, I learned how to drive stick shift. And um, it had some problems and whatever else, so I sold it for $250. So it's not much money. It was back then to me, <laughs> you know. Um, and by the time I was 16, I was able to get my first car. It was a Plymouth Champ. Had the dual range transmission thing. Anybody out there is familiar with that. Uh, kind of a rare car actually now. And, you know, the one I had was pretty much beat pretty badly till I got rid of it, being a teenager and driving it and whatever else. But uh, I did things with my life. And I'm still planning on doing things with my life. Um, believe me, YouTube is not a, um, the end of what I want to do. Uh, far from it. Um, so hopefully that's been an encouragement to you, brethren. But um, do not fall for any of the three of those sins that the Bible condemns. Psalm 37, verse 21. The wicked pay, borroweth and payeth not again. Don't do that. If you're going to have to borrow money for something, then pay it. No matter what, pay it off. Okay? Uh, the second one there, the Proverbs 22, verse 7, the, the borrower is servant to the lender. Remember that. Try to stay debt-free. Try to stay out of debt. Try to pay for things in cash. That's the best thing I can, you know, best advice I can give you. You stay out of debt. You make your own hours. You are your own boss. You go and you get into debt. Now you have bills to pay. It can work out sometimes. I get it. You might have to get a mortgage in the future or something. I don't know, depending on how the financial system goes. Who knows? But just remember that concept. And finally, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. You need to work. And if you're not working, and if you took the stimulus check thing and whatever else, that's between you and God. I didn't take a cent of it. And I will never take any stimulus check type of thing like that from the government. I don't believe in it. Um, and I don't want to hear your stories and, oh, brother, I'm so sorry. That's between you and God. Be a man. Get that stuff figured out. All right? Um, get out there and start doing some things with your life. Please. Um, for your own sake. And uh, I'm not going to give you advice on that. I already have given you advice in this. Um, work hard. If you have to go clean toilets or bag groceries at a grocery store or work at McDonald's or something like that, Work your way up through. Work there. Look for a different job, a better job. And work hard wherever you go. Very important. So that's going to be it. Um, I do believe that this housing market is going to crash. I think it's going to crash very hard. I think there's some really bad financial times, and the only people that are going to make it are those who work. Um, quite frankly, the Lord expects you to work. All right? And think about it. Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, came to the earth, and what did he do for the first 30 years? He worked. I actually worked for over 30 years. So, before I went into ministry. So, please do take my advice on this. Um, and don't fall for the mainstream media lies that the housing market's getting better and the economy's getting better, because it's not. Alright? So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.